I feel very humble coming to talk to you because you all know more about Fafaj Andre than I do. Uh, I am a new boy. What am I going to talk about? What am I going to tell you? You know most of this. Uh, it should be the one that says 1970. Yes, correct. Um, and then I thought, you know, my perceptions of Whiplash injuring are maybe different from yours. My understanding of Whiplash is similar to yours and is very different from that of my colleagues, my medical colleagues, and that I perceive that the problem is in educating our medical colleagues to understand about profession, to educate our medical colleagues on the causes of the craniocervical junction syndrome. They recognize it in patients who are born with a Chiari malformation. They don't recognize it in patients who have been in a whiplash type injury. They don't add the two together. There's another big group that has become evident to me, which we'll talk about later, those people with connective tissue disorder who also suffer from symptoms of the craniosalacal drug syndrome. And also we're dealing with a lot of very arrogant medical people. Who know best? <laughs> they think they know everything. Radiology is a very, very broad specialty. It has about five different modalities to use. I don't know how many systems in the body it's applied to. And our knowledge of each of these systems is becoming greater and greater. So people, in fact, are learning more and more about less and less. And shortly they will be experts in nothing. <laughs> um, and I have, to, I have to deal with these people. Arrogant professors of radiology who know nothing more about the cervical spine than that which the neurosurgeon wants to know. Is the alignment correct? Is there a disc I can operate on? Doesn't want to know anymore. Mm. I need to learn how to use this. This, this one? It's the arrows. Yeah. Well, here we have a, a picture. It's a cross-section through the chest, it's a CT scan. You can see, uh, let me see if I can find what I came with. Yeah, I've got it here. Right, we've got lungs, we've got a heart, we've got the pulmonary vessels, something there, skin and bone. Right? <laughs> what you didn't see is there is, and maybe some of you cannot see it still because we have the lights on it, but there is a gorilla there, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you see it? Yes. Okay, yes. and this is from a paper from Harvard where they found that 83% of qualified radiologists specializing in the chest <laughs> did not see it. So we're in big trouble. <laughs> and this gives me the opportunity to show you some MRI pictures that I love. One for the neurosurgeon. Right? Here, here we have a lumbar spine. Yeah, nice lumbar spine. Liver, spleen, kidney, and arm. <laughs> yeah. It's not an arm. You know, it couldn't possibly be an arm. This is not Cronus. This is a kidney. This is an adrenal tumor, and this is some loops of small bowel that happen to look like the hand. So it's not Cronus. <laughs> no, Cronus was the son of Uranus and the father of Zeus, who ate all his children <laughs> until his wife hid Zeus so that he didn't get rid of them. Right? <laughs> One for the neurosurgeons. Right? This poor lady has, not a lady, but it is a secondary from a melanoma. I have a collection of birds. <laughs> this is atrophic uh, gluteal muscles. It looks like a swan. This is the hand of a patient with, with the alarm device on their abdomen having an MRI scan. 
a little duck in the bladder, and here's another duck sitting on eggs. <laughs> you study the sacrum. We have an animal collection. <laughs> you look carefully in the spine. You can find pigs. Even in the brain. Clowns. And one which is very topical in London, little teddy bear. <laughs> so perception is important. And unless you know what you're looking for, you will not see it. And sometimes you will see things that clearly are not there. So we have to be careful about that. I've been working with NMR or MRI since 1980 when I returned to Scotland from my fellowship in Canada I left uh, a job as head of nuclear medicine at the British Columbia Children's Hospital to come back and, and, and had to take the opportunity to work with the physics department with the world's first whole body MRI scanner and this is just my little penchant for, for history uh, this is Bill Edelstein, Jim Hutchison um, two lecturers in the university who built the world's first whole body machine Nottingham had a, a brain machine and uh, Picker at Hammersmith were building a proper bigger looking uh, superconducting system but this was the world's first and in 1979 they came to me and they said Francis, look at this wonderful thing we're doing right? and they told me about it and I said yeah but you've got a movement problem <coughs> see how the heart is beating and giving an artifact and Jim Hutchinson went away and he invented spin warp imaging Spin warp imaging is integral to every MRI machine in the world today. It improved the image quality. Um, we were working at 0 0.04 Tesla. Today we will work at 1.5. And this is our first patient, examined on the 28th of August 1980. <coughs> patient had a proven large esophageal <coughs> cancer. I was in nuclear medicine. We had done a liver scan with technetium looking for metastases and found them. There was no CT in these days. Ultrasound was in its infancy. So we did the MRI scan and what do we see? We see the tumor sitting in here behind the heart. We see the two chambers of the heart and we see pushing up through the dome of the diaphragm a liver that has a, an increased relaxation time with metastases within it. We look more closely at the metastasis because that's why we were looking at the patient and you see these increased uh, signal intensity tumors fluid in the stomach a normal vertebral body at this level but an abnormal vertebral body at this level so i think this must be bone metastases we do a bone scan and proves it so the world's first patient to be studied by MRI as a volunteer, we actually found something that wasn't known about it before. So MRI was going to be a big window. Um, yeah, this was what we had to compare with. In those days. This was the state of the art CT cystic glioma, shown I think better in this very primitive MRI because you could see the fluid within the cyst, and you can actually see the precipitant of the cells at the bottom. <coughs> anyway, enough of that. I moved to London when I retired five years ago um, and, and took my knowledge of upright MRI with me because in 1987 I had met, in uh, 1997 I had met Raymond Damadian and said I would buy his prototype upright scanner. Damadian did the first MRI scan on anybody. He did it on Larry Minkoff, and they may give you the date and the time. It was four o'clock in the morning on a whatever, because he wanted the Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, but Larry sat there for four and a half hours. <coughs> and they got an image. The image looked like this. Here's Larry back in 1977, and here's Larry, 30 years later, <laughs> sitting in the upright scanner, uh, reproducing. 
So why do we persist in scanning people lying down when we look at the pictures as if they were standing up? Why do we persist in scanning people lying down when the symptoms are when they're upright? Right? All your patients with low back pain are worse during the day. Up, walking around, sitting around. My sciatica is worse when I drive for a length of time. Not when I go to bed. So, an upright scanner, you can scan people horizontally. And you get an image of the lumbar spine look like this. You can scan them standing. You can scan, scan them standing. And the image, of course, changes subtly because of the effect of the uh, muscles on the spine. Or you can scan them sitting down when they lose their raw doses because the muscles relax. Furthermore, you can bend them forward and you bend them backwards. Then if we look at this young lady, the lady comes with, uh, with, a, with a sore back and sciatica, normal discs. Bottom disc is, is a diseased disc. She's obviously lying down. Her abdomen is lovely and flat. And she sits down, and gravity comes over. All the soft tissues fall forwards, and the difference in appearance between there and there becomes evident. It is different. So I believe everyone should be scanned uh, upright. Anyway, we don't have a lot of time. Um, similarly, uh, and we'll talk about tonsils later. But just a little case study. And you can read as well as I can. <laughs> and, yeah, the radiologists come and they look at this and they say, oh, look, we've got a black disc. Don't they love to say that, a black disc? Some modic signs. People love modic. I mean, Mike Modic, I mean, I've known Mike since he wrote his first paper. Uh, he, he was looking for papers. He was an up-and-coming fellow. Uh, <coughs> Does it explain the symptoms? No, it doesn't. And if you go back and look, there's a little bit of a cerebellar tonsillar descent, which is far more evident when the patient is upright under the effects of gravity. So I don't think I have to make a case for doing upright MRI. Uh, I have to make it every day when I'm fighting with my radiology colleagues who don't understand it. And I first became interested in the uh, whiplash problem ten years ago. So the study was published in 2009. Um, it's a case control study of cerebellar tonsillectopia. Well, it was a wonderful study. We had two radiologists, one in North America, one in, in, in Europe. And we had 1,200 patients. We divided them in two. Half were, were scanned supine, half were scanned upright. And half of each of those groups either suffered from neck pain with no history of trauma or suffered from uh, pro problems following a whiplash type injury. So we have the four groups that you can see. And we look to the, the, the site of the cerebellar tonsils, and there are none here obviously. This is just. Uh, and the two radiologists, I think, uh, we agreed. And that just tells you the ones we took out. I'm more interested in showing you the result, that in the non-trauma cases, the incidence of low-lying cerebral tonsils in the two positions was almost the same. But those after trauma in the recumbent position, 40% of the patients have low-lying tonsils following a whiplash type injury. But this is far more evident in the upright position. <coughs> this surprised even us who were, I suppose, hoping that was going to be the result. 
And I think the strength of this is it was, was a double blind study, and the two radiologists, if we had wanted to talk, we would have to phone each other at you know, six hours difference in time, so it was not going to be yeah, a likelihood. May I ask? Uh, I didn't uh, understand the. The last uh, one. Uh, no. Can you explain uh, the first line? The portions of cases found to be at sea level of. At the level of the frame magnum or below. <coughs> Proportions of what? Of, of the brain? Of the cerebellar tonsils. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, So, what we show is that following a whiplash type injury, that's about 40% of patients will have low lying cerebellar tonsils when scanned in the supine position. And in the upright position, we find that it's as high as 72%. And what does this mean? Is this maybe the manifestation of some disease that, that had hitherto not been discovered? Or we think that the most likely explanation is that there's destabilization of the small ligaments supporting the brain stem and in the upper cervical cord at that level. And if you go to the literature, that there is a relationship between the so-called fibromyalgia rheumatica syndrome and trauma. Fibromyalgia, fibro, fibers, painful. It's not a very good diagnosis in my book. And so there are two papers that, 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 that suggest that there is a relationship between painful muscles and <coughs> the flash type injury. So whether it <coughs> results from whiplash, the condition is four times more prevalent in whiplash victims. And again, the proportion that we found is very similar to that which is reported in the literature as having chronic pain symptoms. So, the conclusion, one in four of the trauma patients uh, tonsor ectopia is only seen in one in four of the trauma patients, um, but only in one in 18 of the non-trauma patients. So, the overall importance is that it's important to show abnormality if it exists, and to exclude it if it does not exist. This is important for the insurance companies that we all love so much. Mm -hmm. to, to convince them that to do a scan correctly will save them money, will help the patient, because we will know from the scan that there is no significant abnormality, and they don't buy that. I don't understand why. Anyway, we know that we know all this symptoms of the cranial cervical junction <coughs> syndrome. Your patients tell you all the time. So we're going to move on. This we also know, but I'm sure to, to remind us that there is a preoccupation in, with my, in, amongst my radiology colleagues that a whiplash, they don't know what a whip is. And they certainly don't know that when you crack a whip, what happens. When you crack a whip, it is the tip that makes the crack. It is the tip where most forces. They all think that this is the area they should be looking at radiologically, but they forget that this is where the largest force has been. And okay, we do see signs and we do see damage down here, but we miss problems up here. I know that if I'm working with the hammer and I break it, I have never broken the shaft yet. It always breaks here. <coughs> a very nice case of someone who was involved in a 
whiplash injury. And this is the examination uh, within two weeks. And the radiologist writing his paper chose it because he was able to say that there was good discs, that there was even alignment, there were smooth curves. <coughs> And then they come back 15 years later. And we know it's the same patient because if you look at the shape of the sphenoid air sinus, it is the same. But the rest of the area has undergone 15 years of development. The teeth have got worse and they've been filled for a start. She now wears earrings. And they say there is sharp misalignment, disc changes. I read that, but it's fine. And okay, there has been change in the lower part of the cervical spine. What they omitted to put onto their picture <coughs> was that there are gross changes at the cranial cervical junction. And if you go back, there's a suspicion that there has been a fracture of the odontoid peg. Certainly, there are gross osteoarthritic changes here now. There is gross realignment and malalignment. And this has been omitted from the radiological report because they don't look there, because they don't understand. Again, the hammer breaks where it joins the shaft. This was picked at random from a case referred to me, having had a normal MRI of the cervical spine. Yes, it's normal. It's normal as far as the average working neurosurgeon is concerned because they've looked very nicely we're losing power here they're looking very nicely at everything below C2 but what about what happens with the atlas and the axis it is ignored universally not in Sweden not in Norway, not in England, but across Europe, across the United States, across the world. So, I've looked at a series of patients. Uh, I have 332 patients referred to me from the Ironova company in, in Norway. So they're a selected group. They self-select themselves. They are individuals who as you heard Bo Christa tell us, about they've fallen down on the ice, they've been hit in a car, they've, gone over, they've driven over the edge of something and, and they have had it. They put that type into it. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Doc. And in that group, looking at them quickly, 85% of these people with the, all of them suffering from some or a lot of the symptoms of the cranial cervical junction syndrome, 85% 85 of them show an abnormality. In other words, about 15%, I agree, they've had a normal MRI before. But 85% show abnormality um, at the atlantoaxial joint, and about 70% of them show descent of their cerebellar tonsils which interestingly fits with uh, the Freeman study. But also, in raising my other interest in life, approximately 12% of the patients appear to have a connective tissue disorder in that their range of movement is more than normal. They are hypermobile with, and have lax ligaments. So, all the examinations that I do in these patients, we do what everybody else does. We do uh, surgical T1 and T2 weighted images um, from here downwards, but we also do special views of the plantoaxial joint so that we can demonstrate the atlas and the axis, so that we can look for structures that are there to see whether they're present whether they're intact or whether they're damaged. Um, and and uh, here we have the dens, the C2, dontoid peg, the atlas sitting there. We would look for the alignment of the lantoaxial facets. We can look, to, look for the apical ligament. 
And in the actual play, we can look to see the transverse band of the cruciform ligament. Let me do this uh, in an upright MRI scanner. If for some reason, we're going back to front. That's what I would play. Never mind. And what I always study for is spinal alignment, the integrity of the intervertebral discs, the integrity of the neck muscles. When was the last time you saw a radiologist mention the neck muscles? It was like a spine MRI report. It was a long time ago, I'm sure. I looked at facet joint alignment. I looked to see for the stability of the, the spine. The alignment of the atlantoaxial joints and the atlanto-occipital joints, the integrity of the ala and cruciate ligaments, and look to see if there is any cerebral tonsil ectopia. So a normal examination would look like this. On the right hand side, the seated neutral position, but what is intact, normal alignment. I then look at inflection, I look to see that the alignment stays the same. And in the extension, I look to see the degree of extension. Again, to look for alignment, any alteration in the intervertebral discs. And I believe the coronal view is useful too. We then look to see if there's any evidence of uh, lateral invagination by looking at the claroaxial angle, which in most of us in this room is above 150 degrees. Uh, when you have uh, a problem, the angle decreases, the, the, uh, and the brain stem becomes compromised. And uh, this individual, you can see the tonsils are descending. <coughs> we also measure the uh, things that the neurosurgeons enjoy when they come to plan their exams, uh, they plan their treatment. We look to measure, uh, make different measurements, the grab oaks and the uh, um, axial line. And I do that for completeness, but I believe it's only necessary uh, for surgical planning. Now, maybe I don't need to remind you of the complexity of the ligaments holding the elongated peg up against the atlas or away from the atlas. And the difficulties with uh, imaging small ligaments that are in, in different planes using a device that, that can only image in two dimensions. So we can't see them all, but we can begin to learn a bit about them. And if we look here again, we're looking at the specific, uh, again, at the dontoid peg, the alar ligament, uh, ligaments. And here, you can see the dontoid peg is deviated to this side. Uh, the ALR ligaments are not clearly visualized. We've got a lot of structures here. We have the tectorial membrane. Um, we have the tectorial membrane here, um, which become damaged. But let's stay with the big things that we can recognize and here we can see that there is the left band of the cruciform ligament, and you don't see it on this side. Again, here we have a normal ALR ligament with a damaged one here. Again, here. In a patient who has been in a significant injury, I believe that observation is important. I am very aware that across the river further west from here and north in Bergen, they looked at this problem about 10 years ago and they said that in a normal population, something like 40% of alar ligaments and transverse bands of the cruciform ligament 
showed an increased signal or were not clearly visualized. And therefore, this pursuit is a waste of time. That paper is quoted in the courts. It's quoted at me any time I speak at a radiological meeting. Um, and that may or may not be true. Uh, what is true is that if you see this in a patient who has been traumatized, there is a very high probability that the trauma was the cause of the uh, discrepancy in appearance. <coughs> so we then go on to look specifically at the atlas and the abscess and to look at their alignment. And I'm going to show you a normally aligned individual <coughs> sitting looking forwards. You can see the cerebellum, you can see the clivus. As we come down the clivus, then we're coming down, we're going into the thulaforame and magnum, and we're coming to meet the atlas. You see the atlas very nicely there. Bontoid peg is situated in the midline. And as we come on down, we come into the body of C2, all nicely aligned. And an, individu an individual in who has dislocation at the atlantoaxial joint, same series of images, nicely down, we're meeting the atlas there, see the adontoid peg, you see the atlas, you see the adontoid peg and the atlas, and then you see the alignment of the don't uh, C2 below. So, you can see it, that there is a clear malalignment. And in Norway, Dr. No, who works for one of the insurance companies, says, yeah, that is part of the aging process. It may happen when you fall out of bed. Don't believe it. So, just to get somebody there, Two normally aligned, individual not aligned, the rugby player, he's looking, we get then to look to the right and the left to see if there's a difference in the degree of dislocation. Um, here's the individual is looking to the left, the radiological left, you can see the atlas, and you can see part of C2 and part of the atlas in the same image and you can see he dislocates when he looks to the left. <coughs> Another one, I don't think we need to go on and amplify that because there are lots of other things. There's a case of a 39 year old lady, she's normally aligned when sitting, looking ahead and when she looks to the right and to the left, we can measure the degree of rotation and we can look to see if there's any dislocation and she appears to dislocate in one direction and not in the other. We make the sections through the body of C2 parallel to C2. And you make a section through a vertebral body, you only want to see that vertebral body in your images. And as you work up through the joint, you see the joint, and you see the atlas and the axis normally aligned. If they are malaligned, and we're cutting, we've set up to go through C2, and you see C1 and C2 on the same plane, then there must be a degree of subluxation. We're making thick slices there, three millimeters thick. Maybe. So I like and will not say that there is a subluxation unless I see it on two consecutive images. Because occasionally you get a partial volume effect. Yeah, Chiari zero. <laughs> Uh, 
You know, when I was a medical student, the incidence of the Chiari condition was almost zero. Not a common condition. Certainly was not diagnosed radiologically uh, without a very painful procedure for the patient. And usually by lumbar air encephalography. Probably none of have heard of that. I did the last one in Aberdeen in 1978. It entailed backing the patient into a seat with an x-ray tube on one side and a film on the other side, doing a lumbar puncture with them sitting upright, draining out about 50 milliliters of cerebral spinal fluid and pushing in 50 milliliters of air that would bubble up and fill the subarachnoid space, the cisterns. And then we would get them to, uh, by this time, of course, they were headache, nausea, uh, dizziness, very unwell. And then we would say, we want to do an autotomogram, right? We want you to sit there while we make the x-ray and turn your head like this to blur out the head. So CT was a big advance. So about that one's ectopia. And in, the, in patients who are born with the Chiari syndrome, the cerebellar tonsils are, tend to not look like this. They tend to be more in the midline when they come through the frame of magnet, and they tend to be pointed. Following trauma, the tonsils appear rounded and are more laterally placed. And I rely on the axial image to make the diagnosis rather than the sagittal image because many people only look at the midline sagittal image or understand it and of course if the tonsils are lateral to the midline you're not going to see them. So the axial view is the important. So that would be my normal mm -hmm. examination of the patient referred to me following a whiplash type injury. And I believe that the implications of underdiagnosis are far greater than the implications of overdiagnosis. I think it's most important to show ligamentous damage and possible dislocation of the atlantoaxial joint or above or below. I also think it's very important to be able to say to somebody, we have done a very thorough examination. We have applied all the radiological principles that we have developed over the last hundred years to upright MRI, and I can find no abnormality. <coughs> Reassuring to the patient that they may not get better, but they know there's nothing mechanically <coughs> abnormal. It's reassuring to you who are treating them, and it should be reassuring to the insurance companies that they have a test to find their fraudsters. Now we hinted at this in our paper on uh, the first paper where we talked about the cerebral tonsillectopia, that maybe this was the manifestation of a disease hitherto not diagnosed. And yeah, I agreed with that as a co-author. I was ignorant. I retired, I came to London, and somebody asked me to start the upright system in London. I said, we have to be different, we have to look at things that other people cannot look at. My, my two passions are patients with scoliosis, <coughs> to scan them in the upright position, sensible, or those who have suffered a whiplash type injury, so we can do flexion and extension and rotational images and maybe learn something. <coughs> there is a God up there, because my fifth patient was a 30 or 29 year old girl, I think. She was a bus driver. And I, I don't know if you know about buses, but they have a safety device on them that if the door opens while they're driving along, the engine cuts out, in case anyone falls out and hurts himself. This young lady is driving her bus down an incline towards a bridge, and the front door didn't open, but the alarm 
as if it were in the bus stops. She goes forward, she goes back, and she goes forward again, and she's very unwell. And she goes to see her general practitioner, says, I had this terrible accident, I was whiplashed, I now have a sore neck, I have a headache, um, yeah, a myriad of other symptoms. And he agreed, sent her to the local x-ray department for an MRI scan, which of course was reported as being normal. And this girl, she's not normal. She's unwell, right? Before the accident, she was a fit young woman driving a bus, earning a living, enjoying life. Then she found us on the, the web, and she came and she had the examination. She had the examination I just described to you. She was unstable. I wrote to a general practitioner, and I said, she's unstable. Um, you need to do something about it. And he sent her to a rheumatologist called Professor Rodney Graham. Rodney Graham's interest is in connective tissue disease. And serendipitously, the GP sent her to see him. I'd never met him. He phones me one morning and he says, uh, Professor Smith? And I said, yes, good morning. You didn't tell me that you did this examination. And I said, with respect, sir, I've never met you. I've never had the opportunity of telling you. And he said, oh, I send all my patients who have the Earl of Stanlos syndrome for that examination to the United States. Well, we actually developed this in the States um, through the Fonar Corporation. And uh, here's Professor Graham in London sending his patients across the Atlantic to have an upright MRI scan done properly and to look at the craniosphagal joint. So he said, w w would I be able to look at our Stanlos patients? Since then, which is about four years ago, I have two, over 200 patients who suffer from the Earl of Stanmore syndrome. And this is preliminary, these are preliminary results that I figured out about two years ago. I now have 300 I'm working on, and, 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 and the figures are slightly different, but comparing Patients who are diagnosed with the Earl of Danlos syndrome with a normal population of patients who come to me with painful neck. Um, and a normal individual sits in neutral where the mean is about 17 degrees. There's a large variation in all our cervical curvatures. Some of us have straighter necks and others, some of us have... Right? But what I found in my small group is that in neutral, it's about 17%. And interesting, in the EDS group, it's about the same. In flexion, they, they flex more. And in extension, they extend a great deal more. And what I look at in patients after whiplash injury and in my Erostanlos patients or Erostanlos patients, I look again for the alignment. I look at the intervertebral discs. I hope to see the alignment in flexion and in extension. And going through it, and this is unpublished data. Um, this is just a little theory that is formulating in my mind. I've seen this is the analysis of 50, but there appears to be two kinds, radiologically two kinds of hypermobility in patients who suffer from the Ehlers Danlos syndrome. I've called them type 1 and type 2. Um, but if we lump them all together, those are the figures we got. In my type 1, they extend more, but they also extend more in type 2. The, the degree of, of flexion is slightly less. And I think if I just show you a picture, that a typical type 2 is able to flex to this degree, which is far, far more than you would see normally. And in both of them, they extend more than normal. Some of them by as much as uh, 80 degrees, i.e. with spike spine angle of 80 degrees. But what is important is to look at this area here, and you see it in this one quite nicely, that there is a subtle ant subluxation at all levels in this patient between C3 and 
shoot six, which realign when they extend. And due to the laxity of the anterior, posterior longitudinal ligaments and other ligaments. Um, so I'm going to just go on because that has made that point. Um, and that in 55% of patients with the Allostamos syndrome, there is more than 2 millimeters of cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. They are all lateral tonsillar ectopia. It is different in appearance from the uh, Chiari syndrome, and I have never seen a syrinx in association. So one of my crusades is to get rid of this term, the Chiari syndrome, for anybody who has low-lying cerebellar tonsils. The patterns are different, the diseases are different, the symptoms are similar, but again, slightly different. So, they also have an increased laxity, 25 of um, the 49 showed laxity of the ligaments, and it might be 11 of them, what I believe to be an element of dislocation. It makes me very sad makes me very sad because I show these abnormalities they ask me what I can do to help them and I say go back and speak to your doctor I will write a detailed radiological report and your doctor will know what to do I can't say you, your doctor's a bloody fool and won't know what to do right what do I do with it? How many chiropractors understand a tantal orthogonal realignment? If there is a good one close to them, then that's advice. Our National Health Service will not entertain operating and stabilizing some of these patients who clearly need to be stabilized. And I know that, that uh, Dr. Killette will show us the benefits of stabilization and how patients improve by at least 80%. Um, but you cannot get it for your patients in Sweden. I cannot get it for my patients in England on the National Health Service because there is willful ignorance on the behalf of our colleagues to understand the whiplash disorder and the Earl syndrome. I have a few more minutes. Am I boring you? <laughs> Shall I go on? Yes. Well, we, we know that the, we, we've talked about this, the, the, I call it the, the craniosalical junction ligamentous complex, right? But if you go back and look in the books, and you go back to the early Gray's anatomy, poor old Gray didn't realize that at some point around the foramen magnum there had to be a connection between the dura and the, and the muscles of the, the neck. Humanus capitum and the dura. So we know that sitting in between at the base here, this is C1, and the back frame and back will come out here. You've got a, a myodural bridge. And in fact, if you, if you work very hard with MRI, you can identify those things. Here's the, the uh, the atlas. Here we've got the occiput, and here we've got the so uh, the capital muscle there. Here we have the dura. We have a fold in the dura, and sitting in here is the myodural bridge. We should, with good 1.5 Tesla supine MRI, be able to demonstrate this on a regular basis. My job is to educate my radiology colleagues to start to learn the anatomy here and, and to be able to demonstrate it. Right. So we, this is all covered by the tectorial <coughs> membrane. What is the tectorial membrane? Coming down here. Here's the apical ligament. Here's the tectorial membrane. It comes down and the mouth through it, it, it and joins with the, the posterior longitudinal <coughs> ligament. <coughs> the occipital membrane. All of these can become damaged. 
if you do that, that can become torn. This can be torn. The tectorial membrane can be torn and damaged. If you don't know it's there, you won't see it. So I have to educate people to go and look for it. Other people are trying to do this too. All these pictures are from the published literature. And if you look carefully with MRI, even low field MRI, you can see a normal tectorial membrane. Right? You can see it very clearly there. And here we see it again. And here it is thinner. And here it has been torn. Sharp and black there, sharp and black. Damaged there, just marked by yellow arrows. But if you're not looking for it, you ain't going to see it. At the back, the same thing. Here's the adanto occipital membrane. Here it's slightly thinned, and here it has been significantly damaged. Now I write this in my report. It goes back to whoever has referred them, who is perfectly aware that these things can be damaged acutely, but forget that the it's going to be evident months later, and they either do not want to treat them, or do not know how to treat them. It comes to the ALR ligaments, let's look at them again. And they're, they're attached to the tip of the adontoid peg, and you can see them nicely there, and again there. And here, across the night, very normal black, here, reduced signal. I think that is significant. The Bergen paper says not. Discrepancy in the appearance between the two sides. I believe it's, it's even more significant. And then we can look at the transverse fibers of the, the cruciform ligament. Best seen in the axial plane. And again, you see them nice and black and thick. And here, you can see that band, and this is swollen and abnormal. <coughs> the sad facts are that the reported frequency in the literature of the number of missed injuries of the spiker spine varies from 4% to 30%. The most common reason cited from missing injuries is inadequate radiographic examination. So when injuries are missed on initial assessment, the delay, this delay in diagnosis can only be bad for the patient because contrary to Swedish law, diseases do get worse, diseases do progress. Um, so about 30% of patients with missed injuries end up with permanent neurological damage. So I'm going to end there and spend the rest of my day looking for gorillas, <laughs> because that's what my job is. To find the gorilla when he's there, and if he's not there, to tell you. Thank you for listening. And I There must be some questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be quite controversial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, actually, I'm jumping off the subject, maybe, but you mentioned scoliotic patients. You mentioned scoliotic patients, but you didn't talk about that. You like, oh, no, 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 I, I mentioned else. scoliotic patients because <laughs> when I went to London, <coughs> I retired. I'm 75. I retired when I was 65. <coughs> but worked part-time, and, and, and the managing director of Medserina, which is a German company, they have five upright scanners in Germany. I saw him and I said, I'm going to retire finally. Uh, why don't you buy the upright scanner at the University of Aberdeen and run it privately and give me something to do in my, my dotage? And he said, I think about it. And he came back a month later and said, no, I'm not interested. But we decided we're going to go to London if you will come with us. 
So I said, yeah, that's a good idea. And we sat down and I said, if I come to London, nobody knows me. Right? I didn't train in London. Um, we have to do this properly. There are 185 MRI scanners <coughs> within a 27 mile radius of the centre of London that they were competing with. It's my interest is scoliosis, which is best looked at in the upright position. And in fact, it's better looked at with 2D CT in the EOS machine. And whiplash. So we started doing them. The whiplash has caused more interest. And uh, it is now my passion to try and convince people that if you are in a whiplash type injury and you have symptoms three months after continuing, then there is a significant problem. Also, I think it's important that I educate my colleagues that it's all very nice to go and look at the results from the Volvo laboratory, where they put dummies in cars, and they shoot them down the pink into a wall. It's all very nice to go and look at the, the British results done near Wales, where they put dummies in cars and run them down a slope. It's more important to go and look at these patients who are driving on our motorways, who are coming into the motorway, and they're coming into the motorway, and they're looking to the left as they go into traffic, and they get hit. So they don't have a whiplash, as I understand it. They have an oblique whiplash, ten times worse. And I think if you speak to most of your patients who have long-term symptoms, they all had their head rotated at the time of the accident. So that was my scoliosis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, if we meet the person with muscular ectopia, what do we do with that information? And what, what, what is the next step? Okay, cerebral. Yes. yes. Cerebral tonsillar ectopia is um, something that is not well studied because, as I say, one of the medical students. Very few people were diagnosed with it. It was difficult to diagnose. Now it is easy. And from cadavers, it has been said that five millimeters of descent is normal. And I accept it. When it's greater than that and it's likely to cause symptoms, I'm going to let you ask Dr. Gillette that question. Because he is someone who treats patients with that condition. I've never treated anybody. But what I believe is that if you do have low-lying cerebellar tonsils, you need to, and this is a very personal, based on observation, you have to make sure they do not suffer from the ehlers danlos syndrome. Because there are a group of patients in England with the ehlers danlos syndrome who have been treated by very competent and good neurosurgeons who treat patients with the Chiari malformation by decompression of the parietal magnum, which works well for Chiari syndrome, but many of the EDS patients become worse because their tissues are lax and the brain continues to descend. So the answer to your question is, I do not know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, one of the basic problems with radiology is that it's eminence-based, so uh, it, it's dependent on the observer and the interpretation. Uh, can you tell us about your views on developing this uh, kind of automatic image analysis, artificial intelligence-based? What's the state of the art? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, two of the... One of the problems is two of the problems with radiology. It is evidence-based. Um, and from the radiologist's point of view, if it's not very good, <coughs> the evidence is there forever. Excuse me, is it good if you may use the well, microphone? It, it works better. Well. You can hold it yeah, on sure. the, as you did yeah, you can do that. last minute. Yeah. Um, sorry. The, uh, the evidence is there forever. His written report, her written report is there forever. But so are the images. And that is an advantage that we can go back and review the images as our knowledge increases. 
And I think that, that over time, with the increased resolution of CT and MRI, that the quality of the images will be such that in digital form, um, that we will be able to develop pattern recognition for a lot of radiology, and radiologists are going. Um, so the, the, the next stages are clearly going to be that patients will be able to put their symptoms into a, into a program and a, a di differential diagnosis will appear. And then in time, that will be married together with the radiology. But I'm not an expert in that field. I predict when I'm dead and gone, in about 20 years' time, you're going to have 3D holographic MRIs. It's a long way away, but that's how it's going to be. And you're going to end up with a virtual image of your patient. You'll be able to peel off the skin. You'll be able to take away the muscles, look at the ligaments, get rid of the bones, see the blood. The better person for you to ask this question is, 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 is Bill Christa, our last speaker, who is, is working on that way forward. Um, <coughs> would you like to step in? Well, I don't think time, but I did present a paper in Los Angeles last year in an AI conference, artificial intelligence conference, where we just compare the uh, this comfort drawing with uh, thorough clinical and radiological examination. And we could predict the radiological exams from the pain drawing. So it's it's the future is very much what Professor Smith says. It's there. And, uh, 